Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we're going to get started in just a minute. Um, but before we do, I wanted to um, give a few announcements. We will be recording this event and we'll be posting the video on the Basic Science Events website. Um, you can go there to view this event as well as uh, videos from the other events in the series, both this season and in prior seasons. Um, because we're expecting uh, quite a few attendees, we are gonna keep the audience muted throughout the event to minimize background noise. But we would like to hear from you. So if you have questions for any of our panelists, um, please post them in the chat. We'll be answering them um, throughout the event. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, and now it's my pleasure to welcome the interim dean of the Division of Mathematical and Physical Sciences and the professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, Richard Allen. Richard will also be this evening's moderator because he is the director of the Berkeley Seismology Lab. His research includes the development and implementation of earthquake early warning technology, harnessing geophysical networks to provide seconds to minutes of warning. He also studies the dynamic processes of our planet, including subduction zones, faults, and plates in an effort to understand what drives deformation at the surface. So uh, with that, I am going to hand it over to Richard. Great. Well, thank you, Susan. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to Basic Science Lights the Way. I'm Richard Allen, Interim Dean of Mathematical, Physi Mathematical and Physical Sciences, and I'm delighted to be here this evening to share another fascinating science story with you as part of our series. Now, we launched this series of virtual talks last fall in the midst of the pandemic, and it's pre proven to be such a good way to connect with alumni and friends across the country that we opted to keep it going, even as we here on campus have resumed our in-person education and research. As many of you know, this series is intended to share the excitement of discovery and shine a light on the process of basic science. And by basic, we mean fundamental and foundational science upon which we build uh, many capabilities. Um, this is the type of curiosity-driven science and research that allows us to uh, devise or revise theories and to develop general truths. While it's important to apply our science to solving problems and finding therapies or cures, without this basic research, there can be no breakthroughs or innovations that lead to applications or, of course, to accolades that we're also proud of, like Nobel Prizes. Okay, so to tonight's topic, it's earthquakes. Now, this may seem like a very California-centric topic. I want to remind everybody that they are, of course, happening all over the world, and they remain a serious threat to life and to the fabric of our societies, both here and around the world. Now, of course, we're all emerging from this global pandemic. Um, those of us on the West Coast have also experienced fires and the effects of smoke over the last few years, and frankly, we are all exhausted. Still, we have to remain vigilant to the array of threats that our society faces. And here at UC Berkeley, we take that responsibility very seriously. The fundamental research we do teaches us about the physical processes responsible for climate change, for wildfires and for earthquakes. And when the opportunity arises, we also look to apply our new knowledge for the betterment of society. And I think we have a great example of that to share with you um, this evening. So first of all, full disclosure, as you heard from Susan at the beginning, in addition to being the interim dean of mathematical and physical sciences, I'm also a seismologist first, in fact, and the director of the Berkeley Seismology Lab. So this topic of earthquakes is a particular, was particularly close to my heart. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I actually moved to Berkeley specifically for the earthquakes. So this evening, we're going to give you a quick tour of the earthquake problem how we're learning about the physics of earthquakes and some of our efforts to reduce those impacts. I'm gonna start by introducing Roland Bergman, a close colleague in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences and a participant in the Berkeley Seismology Lab. Roland is going to talk about the, some fundamental aspects of earthquake fault processes. I'm then going to introduce Serena Patel, who's a current graduate student working on earthquake early warning. 
And finally, Ching Kai Kong, now a researcher at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and a former PhD student at Berkeley, is going to talk about how machine learning is providing new insights and opportunities in seismology. So we encourage you to post your questions um, for any of our speakers in the chat box. There are a lot of you, of course, um, and so that's why we're asking you to put the questions in the chat box. We're monitoring it and we will try to get these questions answered either out loud at the end of each of the talks um, or in the chat itself. Um, we will also post some links um, to biographies and interesting websites relevant to the material we're going to present to you over the course of the next hour. Okay, so on to our first presenter. If you want to share your screen, Roland. Um, so Roland Bergman is a professor of earth and planetary science, and he leads the UC Berkeley Active Tectonics Research Group. His current research centers around studying active tectonics and problems relating to fault zone processes and crustal deformation using space geodetic measurements and mechanical models. Okay, Roland, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Richard, and thank you all for being here today. So, on October 21st, 1868, so just a little under 153 years ago, a large earthquake occurred on the Hayward Fault. What you see here is a simulation, a mathematical model of the slip and associated shaking uh, that may have occurred at that time. And so within a little less than a minute, we had severe shaking across the East Bay, but also uh, affecting San Francisco across the Bay. The Alameda County um, 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 Center, the, the county jail and the courthouse uh, were completely destroyed. Downtown Hayward was leveled. The old mission in um, Fremont, Mission San Jose, also was severely damaged. And as I said, damage was also uh, very severe, especially south of market and areas of, that were built on fill and soft sediments. There was significant destruction. And the earthquake, in fact, was referred to as the Great San Francisco Earthquake, a title that was taken away from it only in 1906 by a much larger earthquake that ruptured the San Andreas Fault uh, in that year. So what you see here is a shake map, a distribution of the shaking from reports and accounts and images like the ones I shared with you, showing the distribution and the intensity of that shaking. So we know that this was an event of roughly magnitude 6.8, anywhere between 6.7 and 7. It did cause a large number of casualties. It was still the seventh most deadly California earthquake, but clearly back then a lot less people lived in the Bay Area, about 1 30th the number of uh, inhabitants in the Bay Area. So an event of comparable size would clearly cause much more destruction and damage and casualties if it were to occur today. So we have big earthquakes on the Hayward Fault based on historical accounts, but the Hayward Fault is a little bit strange. It also creeps. Creep is slip on the fault that we can recognize at the surface by damage accruing in pavements and sidewalks and buildings built across the fault that indicate that every year by just a very small amount, just a small fraction of an inch, the fault slips. If a fault slips by creep, that means it doesn't potentially slip as much in earthquakes. Uh, down here at the bottom, you can see how from decade to decade, a curb in the city of Hayward had been recognized to show this steadily accumulating creep uh, very nicely. In fact, one of the best examples of creep uh, and us living on a creeping fault is our own football stadium. Cal Memorial Stadium was built on the Hayward Fault and was damaged so, so severely by the ongoing creep since its construction in 1923 that made campus decide to retrofit it, completely rebuild the interior 
um, uh, about 10 years ago. And even today, the outer rim of the building, the outer wall is the original building. We can see evidence of that creep escaping fissure uh, in the section of the fault. And we can measure that creep and deformation associated with the Hayward Fault using space geodetic techniques, one of which is GPS. What all of us have on our phone, we have somewhat larger antennas and more expensive receivers that here we set up on the corners of the stadium. And within just a few years, we could see that stations to the northeast side of the Hayward Fault moved relative to those stations here on the campus side, on the west side, uh, by about four millimeters. Now, four millimeters is not the whole slip rate. We know from geologic evidence that the Hayward Fault slips more than twice as fast, about 10 millimeters per year, a little less than half an inch per year. So we can use GPS to measure the deformation along the fault and away from the fault. And we have another method uh, that is called radar interferometry. This is using satellites that take images of the surface of, of the Earth by bouncing off microwave, radar waves from the surface of the Earth. If we do that every few weeks and keep track of the information about the distance to the ground from the satellite, we can make, make, make maps like this. So what you see here, the colors indicate changes in the motion towards and away from the satellite over the years expressed in millimeters per year. And you can see the Hayward Fault nicely separates blocks of different colors indicative of the creep. And here's the stadium again, uh, not showing how it was torn apart by the creeping fault. So we can use these data to figure out not just where the fault is creeping at the surface, we can also see that um, with our offset roads and curbs, et cetera. But we can use all the deformation data, all these GPS measured velocities at the surface of the Earth and the radar measurements to develop a model of where on the fault slip is occurring, creep is occurring, and where it is stuck. The stuck patches are the areas of the fault that are locked, that are not slipping today, meaning they have to eventually catch up and do so in a future earthquake. So we refer to these patches here as our ticking time bombs. These are patches on the fault that aren't able to slip now and therefore will eventually have to catch up in a large earthquake. And we can do more. We can use the amount of creep and locking we see that distribution from year to year to estimate, well, what is the deficit? How large an earthquake can we get if we have this creep and locking going on, say, for 100 years? And what we calculated is an earthquake comparable to the size of the 1868 event could happen as often as almost every year. And this is consistent with earthquake hazard estimates based on uh, information about past earthquakes uh, in the prehistory before 1868 from geological observations and also the seismicity distribution that estimate the probability of an earthquake of magnitude 6.7 or larger by 2043 at about 33% for anywhere on the Hayward Fault or the uh, Rogers Creek Fault to the north of the uh, of San Pablo Bay. And that is the highest probability of any fault strand in Northern California, in California as a whole. So the Hayward Fault is the biggest known hazard, the most likely fault, not necessarily the first next fault to go, but has a very high probability. Now the creep still matters, even though it doesn't take away the hazard completely. If we do the kind of simulations I showed you in the beginning with a fault that is completely locked versus one that can't rupture in the earthquake on the areas of the fault that are currently creeping, the amplitude of the shaking, the intensity of the shaking, the spatial extent of shaking would be 
much, much, much larger. Now, of course, you will wonder, well, can you predict earthquakes? Are there signs that you can look for that will tell us if there's going to be another earthquake? And we try to keep track of that creep both at the surface and the subsurface with our measurements. Here you see an animation of creep accumulating over almost two decades. And here you see the time dependence of the slip. And there's clearly variability. There's also seismicity, little earthquakes, mostly not felt by us, that occur seemingly randomly, but clearly indicating how that system evolves. Whenever we have earthquakes that we feel, magnitude force, there's clearly concern. And we do know, statistically speaking, whenever we have a magnitude four, the chances of an event somewhat larger go up substantially for about a week. And in fact, after the 2018 uh, January event 4.4 that I'm sure all of you in Berkeley who lived in Berkeley then felt, make me finally get earthquake insurance. So there will be more earthquakes coming, larger earthquakes like the 1868 event. So we should be ready. We should have our homes retrofitted uh, safe. We should have earthquake kits. You should have the earthquake early warning app, MyShake, installed on your phone. You should be ready to drop cover and hold on when an event happens and be prepared for life in the days and weeks and months after the earthquake. Until that happens, I'm looking forward uh, to your questions. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Roland. So yes, we have a question from Warren um, immediately. Um, was it not known that the stadium was originally built on the fault or was it just not appreciated that the significance of that? It was known when the stadium was Build, um, geologists at the university already knew there was a fault. Um, uh, Professor Larson uh, was a geologist at that time. However, they and, and knew about the earthquake. However, it was really the best place in terms of having flat land near the campus. And the alternative of building the stadium in the flatlands near the bay was not considered to be any better. So they took that risk into consideration, but decided to build it anyways. And I, I'll let you decide if you think, in retrospect, that was a good idea or, or not. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to couple two sort of follow on questions together. So can you explain again how the fault creep reduces shaking and hazards? And then perhaps that can lead into another question, which is how do you calculate the probability that a fault is going to rupture in the next 30 years? So the way the creep reduces the shaking is in these models where the creep is incorporated, the fault is not allowed to slip in the earthquake. We essentially understand those parts of the fault to accommodate all their slip by creep. So then when the earthquake happens, they will not participate. And uh, so that is the underlying principle there. With regards to the probabilities of earthquake occurrence, uh, this 33% rate for the Haywood and Rogers Creek fault, for example, that is based in large part on knowledge about the time of earthquakes actually over the last 2000 years from geologic uh, studies, trenches across the fault that established that on average, the Haywood Fault has an earthquake of comparable size to the one in 1868. Every roughly 140 to 150 years, plus minus 40. And so that probability can be translated into the, the formal report for the whole Bay Area that incorporates all the different faults. OK, and I'm going to squeeze in one more question. Um, so if it was known that the stadium was being built on a fault, why not take the precautions that were necessary? And perhaps you could also then say something about the precautions that have now been taken for the, the new version of the stadium. Yeah, that's a great question. So they did apparently try to put in joints on the stadium that would allow for some movement on the fault, but clearly not enough because the damage that had built up was severe enough that it wasn't considered safe. 
During the retrofit, as I said, they completely rebuilt the whole interior of the stadium. They made sure that the two parts of the stadium on either side of the vault are completely separated, can move freely, and build it to standards that we hope, and people say, make the stadium maybe the safest place to be in an earthquake as long as you drop cover and hold on and take good care of yourself uh, at the time of shaking. Again, that's left up to you, but you may be safest when you're at a game in the stadium uh, during the time of an earthquake, uh, if and when that happens. Maybe. <laughs> okay, that's a great place, I think, to pause. We can talk more about this. Um, we'll have some time at the end um, to talk with all of the speakers, and so we can come back to some of these topics and some of the other questions, actually, at that point. Thank you, Roland. That was great. Um, let's, let's move on. So next, um, I would like to introduce Serena Patel. Uh, Serena is a graduate student in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science. Her research interests span seismology and earthquake hazards, earthquake early warning, structural health monitoring, earthquake volcano interactions, and applications for seismic data collected by smartphones. And so the smartphones connection is the MyShake project that she's going to talk a little bit about. Roland mentioned it, and then I did notice the question um, in, the, in the chat about MyShake. We'll come to that question after we hear from Serena. So Serena, please uh, go ahead, share your screen and take it away. Okay. Um, so as Roland mentioned, we can use historic patterns and current observations to make forecasts about the probability of a future earthquake. Um, and in terms of telling the future, this is about as close as we can get, since right now it's not scientifically possible um, to do prediction. For example, I couldn't tell you that there's going to be a magnitude 6 on Friday. However, once an earthquake starts, we can provide um, a rapid alert, which is called earthquake early warning. So how does this work? If we have a region with a fault like this, and the fault suddenly gives way in an earthquake, the energy of that quake will radiate away from the epicenter in seismic waves. The fastest of these waves is the P wave, the primary wave. And of all the seismic waves, this is the fastest and the least damaging. On its heels comes the S wave. And when the S wave arrives is really when the shaking and the damage can begin. So earthquake early warning takes advantage of this particular difference. The, fat, the fastest seismic waves are also the most mild. So permanent seismic stations that are nearest to the epicenter of the earthquake will pick up on the P wave vibrations and rapidly transmit a snippet of data to a central computer, which can then combine small increments of information from multiple stations in order to calculate parameters about the earthquake that's underway, including its size and the region that can expect to feel the shaking. This alert can then be delivered to population centers ahead of the S wave arrival, giving people time to take protective action, like drop cover and hold on, before their environment becomes dangerous. So in order for this to work, every aspect of an early warning system has to be optimized for speed in order to outrun the earthquake itself. And how much time an individual have between a warning and the shaking will, of course, depend on how far away you are from the earthquake source. So this city that's further far afield will have more time to take protective action than someone who's, for example, located near this computer center. And if you're really close to the epicenter, you might actually receive a late warning because you're actually closer to the source than the seismic sensors that we're depending on to detect it. So early warning is a global concept and it's a growing concept with different iterations in various earthquake prone parts of the world. Here in the US, about 20 years of collaborative development with Berkeley on the front lines, of course, led to the first release of public alerting through the Shake Alert program that I just described here in, 2000, um, in California in 2019. And since then, Nearly the entire state has been the recipient of at least one alert, and Oregon and Washington have also begun issuing alerts earlier this year. And work is still ongoing to make the, the system more accurate and efficient. And my research is um, taking one of those tracks. So my research is based on a smartphone app called MyShake. MyShake is a free app that's available globally on Android and um, iPhone platforms. And it was developed here in-house. It was actually a part of Chinkai, who's going to talk later, his PhD research. So there are two main facets of MyShake. 
One is the public facing side. This includes education material and some community sourced experience maps. And in the states of California and now Oregon, MyShake is the delivery service for early warning to smartphones. So if you want to receive the warning that ShakeAlert puts out, you can download this app and it will deliver them to you directly. Now, the second facet of MyShake is actually the app's original intent. It was a citizen science project. So every smartphone has a built-in accelerometer. This is the sensor that tells you whether your phone is upright or sideways. And when a phone running MyShake is um, not being used and it's been sitting quietly for a while, the app will start to monitor this accelerometer for earthquake-like motion. And there's an algorithm built into MyShake that is able to tell the difference between, for example, this is an earthquake or I'm on a train. And uh, Chinko is gonna explain more about how we made this possible or how he made this possible. So when the app thinks that it has detected an earthquake, it sends snippets of data back to our servers. The question that my research is posing is what can we do with this information? What's its quality and how can I take this citizen science and turn it back around um, to provide benefit for other people. So I've taken a couple different tracks with this. Um, one of the things I've looked at is how we could use the vibration changes in buildings that occur when they shake to monitor for damage. But what I wanna emphasize a little more here is how my shake can, in a manner of speaking, close the loop on early warning. So right now it's seismic stations, these permanent stations that are planted all over the place that collect data and report it to the shake alert brain. And then the alert generated is delivered to phones. But what if we could use the detections from phones to contribute to the data that they then receive? So I'm gonna use an earthquake that occurred in September of last year as an example of how this could work. So this is the most difficult type of event that ShakeAlert alerts for. It's a magnitude 4.5, which is the smallest magnitude that ShakeAlert will make an alert for. Um, and it occurred right under the dense population area that we needed to alert. So the margin for delivering positive warning time is pretty narrow. But this is also the kind of event where MyShake has the greatest potential to contribute. So the map on the left um, shows the location of the earthquake marked by a white star and the location of the seismic stations that were online were marked with orange triangles. So ShakeAlert requires four stations independently to report earthquake-like motion in order to confirm that an earthquake really is in progress and it wasn't, for example, that a particularly heavy truck went by. So the P wave has to have reached four of the nearest stations on this map. On the right side is the graph representation of this, where the horizontal axis is distance in any direction from the epicenter. And as you move up, you're moving through time. The green line is the P wave arrival um, and the red represents the S wave. So you can see here more clearly the difference between the P wave and the S wave speed. So the P wave, um, the earthquake starts underground and the P wave reaches the surface directly above the epicenter a little less than three seconds after the rupture initiated. And the S wave follows on a, half, a second and a half later. So all of the orange dots represent when packets of data arrive from earthquake stations, from uh, different seismic stations at the central computer um, that it needs to generate the alert. So you've, you need at least four of these to create an alert until about here um, that the system will have enough information to be generating a warning. And indeed, ShakeAlert released its first warning at about four and a half seconds. But what if we didn't just depend on these permanent stations. So here I've added all of the phones that were running my shape's detection algorithm at the time of the earthquake. On the right-hand graph, you can see that all of the phones below the blue line that were able to report earthquake triggering data to our server before seismic stations. So if we coupled these two systems together, we could have potentially created a warning uh, faster by half a second. And this seems small, but when you consider that the time between when the first wave arrived at the surface and the initial alert was generated is less than two seconds, saving half a second is actually pretty remarkable. Um, there are caveats, of course. Phone sensors are not as good as the high quality stations that we've invested a lot in. Um, so the estimates that come out of phone recordings are not always as accurate. But when you have a high volume of data, like all of these turquoise dots, we're essentially strategizing how to balance 
quality with quantity. So my research is looking into the guts of the shake alert process to figure out how phone data can be folded in to improve alerts and cut down on alert time. Um, the, there's some things to figure out, but the preliminary data is actually pretty promising, like this example event. Um, and we also can assess um, from the other side what our user experience has been, and that's also been pretty encouraging. So using MyShake data, we're also able to map how quickly our users are receiving the warnings that we've been delivering. Um, and on the left is this map of alert delivery times or how fast MyShake was able to take a shake alert and get it onto people's phones. And this red circle represents the area that the first warning estimated um, would feel the earthquake. And you can see that all of these points, most of them are less than five seconds, really rapid alerting. Um, the graph on this other side um, represents the intensity of shaking that was recorded on different phones. And we've colored the dots with increasing warmness with the intensity of shaking. And this time zero on this plot um, is when the alert arrived on a phone. So now if you're moving up through time um, and you are above zero, that means that there, there was how many seconds you had between when the alert arrived and when you felt the strongest shaking. That's 90% of the people who received an alert felt the strongest shaking after the alert arrived. Um, of course, we can also think about how, our, how we're doing, how ShakeAlert is doing and how MyShake is doing you, through direct user feedback. And of course, an imperfect system that we're still improving receives imperfect um, reflections, but some of the feedback is really positive and really validates the usefulness and the effectiveness of the system. So I'll stop on this celebratory note um, and I'm happy to take questions. Great. Thank you, Serena. That was uh, that was a really great overview. Um, so uh, first question I want to ask actually is about earthquake early warning in other parts of the world. Can you you showed us a map. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the status of earthquake early warning ar around the world? And then perhaps also Eleanor was asking a little more detail about what's the status exactly in California versus Oregon versus Washington in terms of both shake alert and my shake. Yeah, so um, early warning, it's the first uh, sort of online example was actually in Mexico. They had a really devastating earthquake in 1985 that inspired them to set up a system that was specifically designed to detect earthquakes that occur on the western coast of Mexico um, and send a warning to Mexico City, which is where some really high earthquake hazard is based on um, the soil content that is beneath the city. Um, and then since then, Japan has really come to the forefront in terms of uh, early warning technology. There was a really serious earthquake in 2011, a magnitude nine to Hokuoki earthquake. And for that event, there was early warning available to citizens. Um, so there are other countries that are now burgeoning up with their different systems, different parts of China um, have early warning. And actually uh, Google, the Android system um, is doing early warning using cell phones, um, using a similar technology that I just discussed with uh, MyShake. Um, and they're able to do that in Greece and in New Zealand. Um, here at home in the US, um, we have early warning, as I mentioned, in California and also in Oregon and in Washington. MyShake delivers in California and Oregon. Um, and as of right now, Canada to the, our neighbor to the north is also expanding its network to set up a complementary system so that we'll have sort of West Coast wide coverage. Um, and there is, you know, we could th be thinking about expanding to other parts of the country, but for right now, we want to perfect the system that we already have. Um, another question from Warren. Um, any idea how many Californians are set to receive a MyShake alert? Um, more all the time. And I don't remember the exact download statistics, but I want to say we're in the vicinity of half a million in the state. So actually, I can ask this question. We actually asked the question earlier. So uh, earlier today, we were preparing for a, um, the shakeout, um, the great shakeout, which some of you may be familiar with, which is the annual earthquake drill in sort of late October is next week. And so the MyShake app is going to send out a test alert as a, as a 
as part of the shakeout exercise. So we were actually asking the question of how many phones we would be sending that alert to, and it's currently about 960,000 phones in California um, that would get that alert. So that's, that's how many people have the app on their phones in California. Um, let's see. Um, so I have to ask you this question because I think it's nice to talk a little bit about the experience at Berkeley as well. So you're a graduate student at Berkeley. Tell us what it's like to be a graduate student at Berkeley. Oh, <laughs> um, I think something that's really cool is about the positioning that I have, um, both as a graduate student, but I'm embedded in the Berkeley Seismology Lab, um, which is an operating lab. So there's an operations part that is building the seismic network and maintaining it. Um, there are, in addition to the faculty, there's a series of researchers that I get to collaborate with. Um, and I think it's a pretty neat intersection to be in this different aspects of seismology are all present in one place. Um, so I think that is a pretty cool thing. And I also uh, think it's pretty special that I get to do research that's applied, um, that has real benefit to, to people at large. Great. All right. I think we need to keep moving. We'll come back to uh, Serena, of course, when we come back to our panel um, at the end um, of, the, of the session. So let's move on to Chinkai, if you want to share your screen, Chinkai. So Chinkai Kong is a research scientist at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and previously an assistant researcher at the Berkeley Seismology Lab and a PhD student in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science. He also spent some time as a visiting researcher at Google, where he helped develop um, and build the Android earthquake alerting system that you just heard um, Serena mention. Um, he's interested in seismology and machine learning. Specifically, his contributions are in the domain of earthquakes, um, of earthquake early warning and machine learning tools to help solve problems in seismology. Chinkai's current work at Livermore National Lab ranges from evaluating machine learning models to identify when they will fail, as well as combining physics information into machine learning models to better solve otherwise hard problems. So, Chinkai, over to you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. And to Roland, Serena just gave you several of the examples, like research applications in seismology. But one thing in common is that these days, there's more and more data actually collected in seismology to study the earthquakes. We need to really like a smart algorithms that can extract the information. This is where the machine learning actually comes in. And you probably heard about machine learning everywhere in, in all kinds of like daily activities, like daily applications. But here at the seismology community, like if you look at this figure that we actually have more and more data collected over time. So basically this is showing you a figure of a seismic data, seismic waveform data collected by the seismic community uh, from various networks. And you can see that like by last month, we already collected like within one year about more than 700 uh, terabytes data that are actually collected. So this data is hard to analyze. If you think about like you hire someone to analyze the data and find out like within the data, where is the earthquakes? So it might, might be like you need thousands of people sitting there 24 seven to analyze this data for this whole year. So that, this is why like these machine learning al algorithms are really handy to extract the information automatically by learning the knowledge from the data itself. To give you an example, and this is basically the MyShake example, Serena just mentioned that you probably still have the question, I use my phone differently. I'm working with my phone, running with my phone, taking bus or taking train and so on. So if my phone recorded a signal like this, how do I tell if this is an earthquake or this is just a, some human activities I generated or human, human quakes? So this is like the problem that really can be solved by machine learning because this is like a, a basically 
different type of activities will have different patterns. So if you look at the four figures here, I'm showing you some activity recorded on the phones. For example, taking bus, put the phone on the desk, walking or running. And each of these figure have three panels you see. And these three panels is showing you the time series of the acceleration experienced by the phone in three dimensions. And by looking at these four figures, you already see different like patterns behind different activities, right? And if I show you the earthquake figure, so this is actually the uh, 2014 um, uh, magnitude six earthquake in Napa recorded on my phone at Berkeley. So you can see the clear like earthquake signal so different from the activities that generated by human beings. So this is the way that we actually can tell, but how, how exactly we can tell the difference or capture this difference? Well, we actually already learned this when we were kids. Think about like when we first try to learn, recognize apple and oranges. Our parents usually gave us these two objects and tell, tell us like, okay, this is apple, this is orange. And then we can sense the difference. For example, the shape, the color, the texture, the smell, or even the taste. These are usually called features that characterize the difference between different objects. And we can memorize these features. And then when we have some new objects in hand, we can compare whether these features matching the features in our mind. And then we can tell what's the, what's the object really is. So this is the algorithm we developed exactly the same logic. And the features we actually develop, uh, developed is that uh, like uh, shown here, on the horizontal axis is how fast you're shaking your phone. Basically, you can shake your phone really fast or relatively slow. And on the vertical axis, basically showing you how hard you shake your phone. Like the larger number means like the harder you shake your phone. And each of these dots represents either it's earthquake dots or non-earthquake dots. And you can see that these two features are already telling you about the difference between earthquakes and non-earthquakes for most of the time. So this is the basis that we extract these features to tell the difference between earthquake and non-earthquakes. And this is the algorithm currently running behind my shake to tell the difference and then to detect the earthquakes. So this algorithm sounds really amazing, but to be honest, the machine learning has its, its own limitations. For example, the machine learning will do really well when you, uh, when you train the data, but then when you evaluate the model or test the model on something similar. For example, like I'm showing here that machine learning can do really well to learn the Legos and then to, to, to basically build something from the Legos. But if you change something different, like to give the machine learning models some blocks different from Legos, it will not generalize well because machine learnings are really doing well on the, some, on the data similar to the, to the Legos. So this is why that we need to really focus on how to improve the machine learning models by making it generalize well. So as the model we just talked before, it's also like may work well in one region because you train the model using all the data in one region, but not working well on the other region because of the different geology, different situations and so on. How can we really make the model work even, even though that we, we, we have different situations of the data using the, the model in different situations? Well, luckily that we actually have the physics we actually um, already developed for hundreds of years. These physics laws governing a lot of the natural phenomena that uh, occurred in our world. And this is actually something I'm currently working on, how we actually using earthquake data only in one region and then train a model for machine learning and then 
apply it in another region that it works well, we found that like if we add in some of the physics features, for example, as Serena mentioned that like we already know like the, the P wave, the S wave of the, the earthquakes, these are the earthquake characteristics. We can combine this information with the machine learning model and then make the decision. And this way, the combined model actually works really well in a region where there's no or fewer earthquake data points there. So this is the uh, current research that uh, in, my, in, in my research at the lab as well. And also here, I just give you one example. There are so many examples these days developed in seismology using machine learning to extract information in seismology. And if you are interested, interested in, feel free to browse the uh, Berkeley Seismology Lab a website to, to learn more. I will stop here and take more questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Ching Kai. That was a great overview. So tell us, where do you think um, machine learning can actually help us the most when it comes to seismology? Yeah, I think, I think there's a couple of uh, aspects that uh, machine learning can help us. First of all, it can automate a lot of uh, tedious work. For example, the, the one I just mentioned that uh, in the past we have uh, analytics like uh, maybe graduate students or, or like some researchers sitting in front of the computer pick out the earthquake data. And that takes a lot of time. These days, the machine learning algorithms can really automate the whole process by learning from the data itself. But also machine learning can, can uh, the other point that machine learning can help is that sometimes we as a human being, we overlook some of the features that uh, uh, hiding in the data. And also it's uh, hard to be, to use a mathematical equation or mathematical formula to quantify these features. Machine learning can actually help to find, figure out or to find these uh, subtle features from the data itself. I think these two uh, points are the, the biggest points that can help in machine learning. Combining with the physics uh, I showed in the slides, we think that uh, this will be a powerful tool in the seismology community to study the earthquakes. Hmm. So on the other side of, of this though, right, there's, there's also potentially some dangers of using machine learning. I know people often refer to applying uh, particular machine learning models to certain problems as applying a black box, which sounds somewhat problematic. So what, what do you see as being the dangers of applying machine learning? Yeah. I think that's a good question. For example, machine learning are learning from the data itself, but sometimes it's really hard. You don't, you really don't know what exactly the machine learning learns. You just know that uh, oh, the result looks really good. So understanding the machine learning itself, like what exactly the the algorithm learns from the data, is important. Otherwise, it 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 will fail. Uh, miserably in some of the cases, especially in some of the uh, the critical infrastructures. For example, in in in, in uh, earthquake warning, seconds are more are, are really important. And if we don't understand the machine learning itself, and then it fails during the real time system, then it will causing a lot of like uh, uh, trouble. I think that's why. Uh, learning, understand more about the inner working of the machine learning and also what it exactly learns are important and to avoid of these dangers. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Ching Kai. That was a great overview. Um, maybe I can call back uh, Roland and Serena to, uh, to join us up here um, and we can answer some other questions. If you have other questions, please and put them in the chat. This is your last chance um, to get the questions answered live. Um, but I'm going to start off by asking a question that I know is on the mind of many people um, who are in the audience. Um, and that is, and so I'm going to just going to ask the question they want to know. So when's the big one going to be? Who'd like to take that? 
<laughs> of course, we. I'll quickly say, of course, we don't know. That is obviously the million dollar question. What we do know is there will be big earthquakes, the big one will be coming. And so we have to be ready for it. We can assign probabilities and thereby steer the attention to what is what are the things that are most important to do to, to be more prepared. Uh, but we don't know with any uh, precision when the next big one will strike. So good, I'm glad we handled that one. Thank you. So, so now to sort of, you know, um, Roland, you talked about the um, 1868 earthquake. Um, we just explained that we don't know when the big one is going to be. Um, we, we, of course, a lot of people work very hard on trying to understand the impact of future earthquakes. So my question is, you know, what, what would we expect um, the Bay Area to look like if we had the 1868 earthquake, a repeat of the 1868 earthquake this afternoon? Yeah, I mean, the Hayward Fault, right? It is probably the most urban fault that we know of. Its whole extent is uh, densely populated. There are numerous hospitals, um, uh, important infrastructure uh, all along the fault. So there have been very detailed uh, studies trying to estimate using the shaking that we believe occurred in 1868 and could happen in future earthquakes to assess what would be the damage and impact. And it's not pretty. It will depend on the time of day and much has been done to mitigate the hazard, to improve the strength of buildings, uh, the building codes. Uh, but we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars and um, enduring impact on, on infrastructures, et cetera. So we're doing a great job preparing, but it will still be a severe event when it happens. Serena, do you want to say something about what an early warning might look like in a repeat of the 1868 earthquake? Um, I mean, I think, again, it'll depend on your distance from where it starts. Uh, but if the strongest shaking is when the fault is rupturing directly beneath where you are located. So if we started with the a, an exact repeat, which I think began at the southern extent of the fault and ruptured northward, and we were located in Berkeley, we would actually be able to, to have a few seconds of advance warning um, as the, the rupture and the shaking is making its way towards Berkeley. Great. Um, so a couple of people asked the same question. So let's pose this to, to the group. Will climate change impact seismic activity? Who'd like to take that? I'll take that one. So we always thought of climate weather being completely separate from what the solid earth does, what earthquakes do. We actually do see very subtle changes in small earthquake occurrences in response to hydrological loading, uh, the amount of water at the surface. And so that means that yes, climate change over the time scale that it happens can affect stresses on faults and therefore seismicity. But these are very subtle, very small. So we don't expect more cratered earthquakes or a significant effect, but, but we can actually make out subtle effects of climate on faults through those kind of physical loading processes at the surface of the earth. Great. And then coming back to the machine learning, I'll aim this one at Chinkai. Um, does the nature of machine learning mean that as apps like MyShake experience more earthquakes, they'll get more accurate? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, for, for the machine learning algorithms, we really need a lot of data to train the algorithm. When we have more earthquakes data that are available for the, uh, for the app to learn, and then the app definitely can improve the accuracy. But also right now, the machine learning uh, algorithm on the phone itself right now, it's a relatively static, which means that we need to collect a lot of data and then to retrain the model. And there's also some algorithms that can 
uh, running in real time and then learning in real time whenever there's more earthquakes coming in and then you uh, the, the app will update itself but but that's also not implemented in the in the current version so it's great watching the chat go by i can do this because i'm not the one doing the talking but somebody i'm going to ask you this question chinkai but somebody already offered part of an answer in the chat so Chinkai, is any research being done on earthquake prediction and does machine learning offer any hope? Yeah, that's a good question. So for, for the earthquake prediction is always a big topic in, in a lot of these public, uh, public outreach events. And uh, everyone wants to see if we can predict the earthquake. But right now, to be honest, um, there's no one or like no technical uh, methods that can predict the earthquake. Even though there's a lot of active research going on, try to see if we can find the evidences or precursors uh, before the earthquake and say something about the earthquake, but still we can't find reliable or robust precursors. So for machine learning uh, research, there's like definitely research uh, around this topic. There's people actively trying to find the, the, uh, the patterns in reality, but it's hard. And also like in the uh, lab environment, machine learning already like showed that it can predict the, the occurrence of the lab, uh, uh, lab earthquakes, which is uh, so it, it's still far different from the natural earthquakes, but uh, at least uh, provides us some of the promising future that we can uh, follow that, uh, that path, yeah. So somebody has asked in the chat, when will Berkey housing values decline like those on Florida's East Coast? I'm not gonna ask you guys to answer this question, <laughs> but I can tell you that ever since I moved to uh, Berkeley uh, 15 or so years ago, that's what I've been telling people. If you can't afford to buy a house now, just wait for the next earthquake and then buy as many as you can. That's a, that's a good strategy, I think. Okay, I'm gonna direct this next question to Serena about my shake. When our daily motion and seismic, and seismic motions happen at the same time, um, will our motion patterns somehow interfere with the detection of seismic waves? Yes, they definitely will. Um, so the app actually only goes into what we call monitoring mode uh, when the accelerometer has been quiet for a while. So basically when you've put your phone down on the table or when you've gone to bed, um, that's when we'll start to monitor for earthquake motion because you're, you're definitely right that if you were jogging and an earthquake happened, we wouldn't really be able to tell those two things apart because they would overlap. Great, another question um, from Warren. Parts of San Francisco were much more heavily damaged in 1989 than the rest of the peninsula. Is it predicted that certain parts of the East Bay will be safer or worse off when the Hayward Fault goes? Maybe yeah. yeah, sure. So the, the shaking is really dependent also on the geology that you're on. So the damage during the 1989 earthquake in San Francisco, which was substantial, pretty much all occurred on areas that were built on reclaimed land, on landfill and soft sediments, the cypress structure in the Oakland area. So the areas we're most concerned about are those right fringing the bay, low-lying areas that are also in the East Bay built on, on soft landfill. So those are the worst places. Um, otherwise, differences in the shaking are more moderate uh, in the hills. Uh, steep hills can be a problem, landslides. So it does matter. The stability of the ground uh, your house is on does matter. Okay, I think this will have to be the last question. I think it's actually also a question to Roland. Is anyone studying the relationship between earthquakes and landslides? My understanding is that much of the damage in the hills will be from earthquake triggered landslides rather than the quake itself. So great earthquakes do produce landslides, um, abundant landslides, um, debris flows all around them, sometimes thousands of them. Here in Berkeley, we have active landslides in the Berkeley Hills that some of us live on. I, there's one right near my house. As best as we know, we don't actually know those to have been 
affected by the 1868 or the 1906 earthquakes. And so we really don't know if the hazard and possibility of landsliding, rapid landsliding in those areas will be any higher um, than elsewhere. But it's an important question because it, it is an important secondary hazard, landsliding, uh, that, that we need to be concerned about. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Roland, Serena, and Chinkai for sharing this research. It's uh, really interesting stuff. Lots of great encouraging comments in the chat. I hope you saw those as well. Um, the earthquake problem is certainly a really challenging one, one that will likely stimulate fundamental research for many decades to come. And at the same time, it's great to see how you're tackling this problem and using the insights to increase awareness and reduce the impacts of future events. So please keep it up on behalf of all of us living in earthquake prone regions. Um, for everyone out there, I encourage you to download the BuyShake app. If you're in California or Oregon, it'll deliver alerts. If you're elsewhere, it can provide information about earthquakes around the world, and you'll be contributing to this citizen science project. So it's really great to, uh, to participate in these activities. Um, and I hope that we've demonstrated the excellence that is basic, um, basic science here at Berkeley. Tonight's event was intended to shine a light on the science of earthquakes, but our series of science also helps us to convey the importance of basic, basic science. Berkeley is a long-standing tradition, as many of you know, in doing basic science at the highest levels. Our history can be told as a series of paradigm-shifting scientific discoveries, including the invention of the cyclotron, cancer immunotherapy, the CRISPR gene genome editing. Each of these discoveries transformed a field in the physical or the biological sciences, but each began with a question posed by a curious scientist such as Chinkai, Roland, and Serena. In these times when the importance of science seems to be up for debate, your interest and support in our efforts are, are more important than ever. So with that in mind, I want to say a special thank you to our alumni and friends for gathering tonight and for being a source of important support in both education and research. If there's anything you want to learn about, um, or if you'd like to support our work for which there is a deep need, please be in touch with us. We absolutely want you to be part of the advancing basic science education um, and the science of earthquakes here at Berkeley. We hope to see you at our next event, um, which is the Graduate Student Rising Stars, which will be on October the 26th. Um, with that, Fiat Lux and Go Bears. Good night. <laughs>